This is the Inclusion Think Tank podcast brought to you by New Jersey Coalition for Inclusive Education, NJCIE, where we talk about inclusive education, why it works, and how to make it happen. On this episode, I welcome my guest, Michael McSheehan. Michael is the owner and lead consultant of Evolve and Effect, a company that assists education agencies on how they can evolve their practices to increase positive effects for learners. On this, part one of our conversation, we discuss what changes he has seen in the world of inclusive education in his more than 30 years of working in the field, and how a specific court case in his hometown had a lasting impact on his career path. I would like to welcome everyone back to another episode of the Inclusion Think Tank podcast brought to you by New Jersey Coalition for Inclusive Education. I am your host, Arthur Aston, and I'm happy to welcome my guest on the show today, Michael McSheehan. And I am so happy to uh, talk with you again and uh, to see you virtually. Uh, so thank you for being here, Michael. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you so much, Arthur, for inviting me. Yes, yes. You and I, we met um, over the summer um last year at the uh new jersey uh, coalition for inclusive education had a summer conference and you and i we we met there um so it's good to see you again virtually and um to hear a little bit of um you know your story and your journey and and what you're doing in the world of inclusive education sure yes. happy to be here let's do it yeah <laughs> so uh to get started can you just tell us a little bit about yourself um you know things like how long have you been in the field of inclusive education and um also what led you to create your company evolve and effect okay so all of that <laughs> um <laughs> uh let's see um some stuff about me that's relevant that y'all may want to know um born and raised in the same town as uh, my parents, uh, well, although my father was born someplace else, but really raised in Rochester, New Hampshire, um, just three houses down from where my mother was born and raised, and her her only brother lived in that same neighborhood. Um, so Rochester, New Hampshire, is kind of our family's hometown. Um, every most of the family is is here within a few miles of each other. Um, you know, it's funny growing up in that situation when I uh, applied to college because I'm. I was the first person in our family to, to go to college. And uh, I thought, oh my God, I'm never coming back to this town. I'm <laughs> never coming back to this town. Uh, and lo and behold, I came back to this town, but that's a later <laughs> part of the story. Um, I um, have been working in this field for, gosh, I guess like a little over 30 years now. Um, so I've been around for a while and seen, seen a few things. Um, I originally was going to be a veterinarian, um, but I developed severe allergies. So after several years of going down a path to become a veterinarian, I had to rethink things. Uh, and, you know, this seemed like a logical alternative. Um, I, I looked at a lot of different options, um, psychology, and um, I... Uh, did some informational interviewing with people in our Department of Communication Disorders. Um, I did my undergraduate work at the University of New Hampshire and um, met with some faculty in that department and just kind of said, so what is this field about? Uh, speech language something, pathology, what, what do they do? Um, and uh, the more I learned about the field, I was really interested. And as part of my coursework, my my advisor, Dr. Stephen Calculator, who is a, a was a forerunner in the field of augmentative communication, working with people with significant disabilities, he was my advisor, and he said, you know, there are these classes being taught by these people um, out of the Institute on Disability that are introductory courses to exceptionality, to special education, and you really should take the, their courses. So. I took courses with Jan Nisbet um, and Cheryl Jorgensen uh, and got exposed to things I had just never experienced before. Um, I remember in Jan's class, uh, Jan was really good at getting other people to teach her class. Um, she had a lot of guest lecturers. <laughs> and um, about halfway through the course, we'd been you know, reading about people with significant disabilities and hearing from doctors and professors 
Um, and then suddenly I was coming into class and I saw this guy in a wheelchair, um, and a, kind of a scooter and he had a helper dog and he had a person helping him. And I heard him make some sounds, but they didn't sound like words. And I thought, oh, that's a person with a severe disability. Jan's gonna talk about him today. Um, and in fact, that guy gave the lecture. He wheeled up to the front of the class wow. and pulled out a big green communication board and started tapping away at letters and words um, and gave the lecture for the class. And I sat there at the back of the class, just beside myself, not knowing what was going on um, and completely hooked. I was like, I need to understand this. And that really became kind of the drive of my work from that moment forward. Uh, was understanding communication differences for people who had limited or complicated speech um, and then kind of got pulled into the education arena and it just all kept going from there. <laughs> Sorry, what question was I answering again? How long have I been in this field? A long time. Um, and that's what that's what led me to, to this part of the work. What led me to start my company is when I left UNH, I thought, as an undergrad, when I left and went to Syracuse to do grad work, I thought, oh, I'm never going back to New Hampshire. Um, and it seems like every time I say that statement, it comes back around at me. Um, as I was wrapping up my graduate work, Jan Nisbet, the director of the Institute on Disability, um, asked me to come for an interview. Uh, and I ended up going back to work at the University of New Hampshire. Um, then I left for a little while and did some private consulting. And then came back, I think in early 2000, just came back to just do one, one project for four years. Um, and, you know, stayed another 15 years. Like, so after 20 years, it was time to get out again <laughs> from the university setting. And I started the company, you know, I draw on lots of different people's work. And I, you know, had worked with national technical assistance centers in these very targeted projects. And I just, I wanted some more flexibility. I wanted to choose who I was going to work with. You know, I'm old and grumpy. So I want to, you know, find good people to work with. Um, I wanted greater choice and control over that, who, over who I would serve. Um, and so I started the company thinking, you know, I want to work with schools and districts who are just asking hard questions and who really want like really significant change in education for all students, especially those with disabilities and those who have been historically marginalized. And um, I thought, you know, this is this will be how I kind of just fade into the sunset. This will be my slow retirement. Um, I'll start this little company, just me consulting. Um, and now the company, I've got what, three, four employees, and we've got eight different subcontractors and partners that work on a variety of projects. And, the, and I'm bringing on another full-time employee in July. Like the company just keeps expanding because I think the more clear I got about the kind of work I wanted to do and the kind of people I wanted to work with, those people now, I'm finding those people more and more and those systems more and more that are asking really hard questions and want to do good stuff. Um, so we're trying to put together a team of really good people to do that with them. Um, so um, I do want to go back just to say a little bit, one more thing about the company and what we're doing, mm -hmm. because this is just kind of evolved. I mean, like the company's name is Evolve and Effect. <laughs> and I'm, like it, I'm really interested in, you know, as I said, like the really hard, messy stuff like that just uh, gets me charged up. And a school district approached me, gosh, about a year ago um, to completely rethink how they were teaching autistic learners. And we started a pilot in one school um, and they had been running this autism program that was very much driven by ABA discrete trial training and token economies. Um, and it wasn't being responsive to who autistic learners actually were. Um, and so both undoing this program and supporting these learners to be part of the school community um, in, in small steps, we're getting there. Um, but like, that's the kind of messy work that, that the company's involved with now that's just so exciting. And the outcomes we get are just 
incredible. I mean, it, at this point last year in that program, in that school, they had had by this point in the year, hundreds of behavioral incidents with these students such that they were using restraint and seclusion. So 250 different incidents of restraint and seclusion from the beginning of school till now, a year ago. Since we've started working with them, beginning of the school to now, we've had two incidents wow. where a child needs to be restrained. And that was really just to keep them safe um, in, that, in that circumstance. It's, and it's, it's really messy, it's really hard work. And you know the school just really wants to do better. Um, and so they're asking these really hard questions. And now the district is aiming to expand that to all of their elementary schools where they have these other kind of very much behaviorally driven programs. They're now gonna switch to being very responsive to what is autism and what do these autistic learners need? And how do we do that in a way that's centered on equity and inclusion um, at the same time? And it's just, it's when I started the company, it's not what I thought I would be doing and I'm loving it. It's great. <laughs> that's great. And I, I love that you said once you became more clear about, you know, what it is you want to do, you know, those people found you and you found them and it's like, it's, it's expanding. That's really, really cool. For those who are not watching this on YouTube, I love the excitement I see on your face when you talk about it. Like that's really, that I think that's what is really important because um, to me that that shows that you're in it for the right reasons and you're, you're doing it because you believe in it and you know that there needs to be some changes made and um, to actually see the changes being made. Like you said, you went from all of the incidences that they had before and now they're working with you and they've had two. So you, <laughs> oh, me, me and a team. It's not yes, just me. Yes, yes um, that one is actually done in partnership with a wonderful group called Autism Level Up. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful colleagues, um, uh, Amy Laurent and Jacqueline Feedy. Uh, they are incredible partners in this work. So I really don't want to say like Michael went in with a bunch of special yes. dust, right? right. Just made great things happen. <laughs> um, there's a team of us, and you know now our challenge is we need to work ourselves out of a job. Right, like we need to build the capacity and get out of there. Um, you know, they had contracts with these behavioral agencies for six years and were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. Um, you know, and I look at it and it's like, well, that should come back to you. Like you all should be able to do whatever Amy and Jacqueline and I come in and do, right? Like we want to support them to do that. There's plenty of work to happen in the world. We don't need a district to be paying us forever, right? <laughs> Which may be unpopular and probably not a really great business plan on my part, but I want to work myself out of a job. Yes, right. Oh wow, that's that's a good one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I guess um, kind of like a follow up question to that. You mentioned that you have been doing this work for uh, thirty years or over, over thirty years. Um, what are some of the changes you have seen in those years of working? And um, I guess, where would you say uh, improvement still needs to be made? <laughs> um, loaded questions. Yes. Um, you know, gosh, what's changed? You know, we've, we've really shifted, you know, in the area of inclusive education. And I'm not sure that that's a helpful thing to call it anymore, but probably another podcast. Um, uh, we've really shifted from this one child at a time work to more system-wide school and district and state capacity building. And I think that that's been a really important change in the field. Um, we, we need to kind of look at the broader systems and structures um, that have maintained separateness for kiddos, and we weren't getting to some of those um, kind of systemic barriers, that kind of institutionalized ableism that has played out in schools. Um, and the, there's been a shift now to attend to that much more. Um, so that if you make these changes school-wide, it can, it can lift up many more students than just trying to do one student at a time. That said, we still do do one student at a time because each kiddo is gonna need really specific supports. Um, other changes in the field over time. Um, you know, 
alignment with these school-wide frameworks like multi-tiered system of supports, universal design for learning. Oh my gosh, when we started this work, we didn't have universal design for learning. <laughs> and wow, how helpful is that in terms of thinking about curriculum design that's built for all of the learners that you have, like to know that that's achievable, that we, you know, and I've seen it happen in schools in really great ways. And when that's in place, so many barriers come down and, you know, there's still more to remove, but that's such a central one um, around curriculum design. Um, you know, and that that's something that really works well. Um, you know, something that has not changed this is going to sound weird, but research outcomes have not changed in the 30 plus years that I've been in the field, right? In over in the time in my time in the field, the research outcomes have held constant, right? We keep showing that yes, we should be putting kids with significant disability labels into general education classrooms. Yes, we should be teaching them general curriculum, and we can. And that's better than the alternative of being in separate settings. Right. So last year, I don't know, you probably did a podcast on this. I haven't listened to all your podcasts, but like last year, there were a series of huge studies that came out um, that once again reinforced this large scale studies looking at students with significant disabilities across 11 states. Right. All of their all of their outcomes point to more time in general ed results in higher scores on reading and math, better social relationships better opportunities for employment. And this is for students with the most significant disabilities. So like it's, at some point it's no longer about like do some more research. It's really about how we do this. And I think that that is a thing that's also changed in the field. Um, we're thinking differently about the how piece of this work. And how are we gonna partner with schools and districts to do this long-term heavy lift change, right? Like think about all the work we still have to do in the area of racism in schooling. Mm -hmm. um, we've got as much, if not more work to still do around ableism in schooling. Um, and we've got schools leaning into that conversation across the country. Sorry, I may have gone off to a shiny object. Did no. I answer your question? You, you answered it. Fantastic. <laughs> like that was, I loved what, you know the research hasn't changed like that was i said whoa <laughs> so true it hasn't no it Which, hasn't you, know, <laughs> you would expect in most endeavors in education we expect to get you know lots of mixed results you know but if, if you're you know 40 years into the work and all the studies that compare outcomes tracking kids across different settings. If all of those comparative studies keep pointing in the same direction, at some point you say, okay, so maybe we should follow the research. Mm -hmm. Like maybe that's a good thing to do. Yeah, maybe it's actually saying something. <laughs> wow, yeah, that was that was a great, great answer. <laughs> so um, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, you grew up in Rochester and New Hampshire. And um, after after we met in uh, over the summer, I you know it was my first time meeting you and learning about the work that you do. So I did some research and looked up some things that you've done, and I've listened to some podcasts and things that you've been on, um, you know, before then and since then. And something uh, that I heard you speak about that I would like for you to um, discuss here as well is uh, the court case of Timothy versus Rochester, which took place in your hometown. Um, so can you share with us what that court case was about and how and why it profoundly had an impact on you? Gladly. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, it really has become this driving force in my life. And it's in part how the company came to be named. So fun story or not so fun story. Um, so Timothy W., um, was a student born in Rochester, New Hampshire in December of 1975. Uh, born with multiple disabilities, lots of things going on for him. Um, had, a, had attended a local child care development center um, in his early years, you know, three to five years old or so. And, um, you know, they, you know, get a figure, we're going back now, way back when, right? Public law 94-142 had just come into effect. 
And here's this kiddo in Rochester, New Hampshire, um, whose who's, who's being, whose life existence uh, will put the challenge out there for folks. Like, did we really mean all learners mm. with disabilities when we said public law 94, 142? Um, and so in the kind of early childhood and preschool arena, <laughs> they started doing some work with him and coming to school. But when it came time for him to transition into the public school system, K through 12, the school district decided that Timmy, Timothy, was not educationally handicapped because since his handicap was so severe, and I'm using the language of the time, mm -hmm. since his disabilities were so severe, he was not, quote, capable of benefiting from an education and therefore was not entitled to one. Wow. Now let that just sit in for a second. Wow. Here we are, we're around 1980 now, 1981, right? Cause he's now five or six years old about to enter the public school system. And the school system has said, you are so disabled. You're not gonna benefit from anything we should have to offer. Stay home horrifying right and we know that this story was taking place across our country for decades and is still happening in some other ways um so the the school district said we're not going to provide you with any educational program there were back and forths with the state department saying yes you you, need, you really do need to provide educational programming to the student other other programs evaluated him other consultants came in all saying yes in fact Timmy W. Can, can learn some things. We don't know what those are, but here's, here's what we're seeing that lets us know this. And this back and forth went on for six years. And finally, in 1988, Rochester School District appealed the decisions that just came coming back against them to the U.S. District Court. Um, and again, they were arguing Timmy W was not capable of benefiting from special education. Um, and so we're not obligated to provide him with special education under that public law. Um, so that that's huge. Now, parallel lives here, right? So at at that time, I am now realizing that I'm changing my field of study at University of New Hampshire. I start taking these courses with Jan Nisbet and Cheryl Jorgensen, and that's where I learn about the Timmy W case. I don't learn about it in my hometown news. Wow. I learn, I learn that this kiddo has been systematically excluded from public education by going to college. That's where I learn about it. Hmm. And I was really, quite frankly, pissed off. Like, who who is this district to decide who I can and can't go to school with? Who is this district to say that any child um, is not capable of, of benefiting from education? Um, you know, now we've got decades have passed, right? So maybe there are some people now in the Rochester school system who would not would no longer believe that. <laughs> and but that's my hometown, right? So I know that the town put in all this effort and energy to keep a kid out. Um, and that just continues to fuel me. The case also came back with a huge decision that set a precedent for our field in special education, right? Timmy's case raised the question of, do you have to prove that you can benefit before you can get education? And so there's this phrasing in special ed called the zero reject policy, meaning you don't have to demonstrate this capacity to benefit in order to be eligible for education um, and special education services. So that zero reject policy is huge um, and uh, is, is the counterpoint to what the school system was saying. And this is where the company name comes in. In the decision for this case, the judges wrote that educational methodologies are not static, but are going to constantly be evolving and improving. And that school districts, Rochester, are responsible to unveil themselves of the new approaches. So that's 
part of what I want to recognize in entering this and starting this company, right? That our educational methodologies do continue to evolve and we want to select those that have positive effect, that create positive effect for our learners. And I'm really interested in, in working with the districts who want to figure out how all that comes together. Um, so that's why that case is so important to me. Was that more than you wanted to know? <laughs> no, that was, that was great. And one of the things that I wanted to point out, um, because again, I heard you talk about that before and looking up the case, like this happened in my lifetime. I was born in 1981. So it really, <laughs> you know, it really hit me hard. And, you know, I, I have a physical disability. I have spina bifida. Um, but it was just like, wow, like this is not, you know, it's it's not something that happened so far in the, in the past. Because I think a lot of things people like to think of as happening, like, oh, that was so long ago. And that was you know, it doesn't happen that, that much anymore. And it's just like, no, it, it still happens. And yeah. Yeah, it still happens. Yeah, so. not, not in that way right now, it's right. it's become a little bit more covert and subtle. We're right. not so subtle, right? Mm -hmm. for, for 10 years, we've seen no change in educational placement for kids with significant disabilities. I mean, just a flat line for 10 years now across all of our states. Um, so clearly we've got, we've got some work to do when we've got that high percent of the population of students with disabilities still systematically excluded from general education settings and general education teachers who are the content experts who can do the best teaching in reading and writing and math and science. Um, right, us special educators, like uh, I can give you something in that arena, but I'm not trained as a person who will teach the fundamentals of reading and writing and math and science. That's, we need our general educators. Sorry, I'm on a pedestal again. I will step down. You're fine. <laughs> you're good. You're good. <laughs> it, again, it, I, I enjoy having these conversations because it really, um, it's something that shows your passion and the passion it, um, you know, it is what the passion is, is what drives you to keep going when things get rough and um you know you have a real uh determination and force behind you pushing you to uh to help make these changes so it's really uh really important to to talk about and to share share these things there's a lot of people in this work asking very similar and hard questions and we will keep learning and we will keep doing Thank you for listening to this episode of the Inclusion Think Tank podcast brought to you by New Jersey Coalition for Inclusive Education. This concludes part one of my conversation with Michael McSheehan. Join us next time when we continue our conversation to discuss implementation science and how it can be used to create change in schools. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our YouTube channel, and to follow us on all social media platforms at NJCIE. Until next time.